Okay, this was originally going to be the uh, closing round table from the Spatial Humanities Conference that we held online a few weeks ago. However, one thing and another, we decided it might be best to wait a couple of weeks and uh, have it as one of the DH Hangouts instead. So what we're looking at this week is a round table on the current state of spatial history and how how we can ex where spatial history is and how we can see it uh, developing from here so as background to it um it's 2009 really when richard white at stanford uh both uh published an article on what is spatial history and also started offering a course on spatial history with the spatial history project at stanford being one of the um one of the uh, many homes of spatial of what's become known as spatial history or indeed more widely spatial humanities uh, from there. So what we're going to do in this round table is we've got three conveners who are going to offer brief introductory remarks uh, and then we'll have an ongoing conversation about how spatial history has changed since 2009 uh, both in the US and beyond the US. Uh, what particular uh, what it means to be a, a pre 19th century spatial historian uh, and look at some questions around what kinds of evidence and arguments are at play in spatial history, what the relationship is between history and geography in 2021. Uh, how have the motivations for thinking spatial historians uh, as historians changed and why and how does spatial history relate to spatial humanities, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. As part of doing that, we've got, uh, I hope, three. We've certainly got two, but I hope we'll quickly get three. She's running to find better Wi-Fi. Uh, people who are going to do those introductory remarks there. Luca Schultz from uh, Manchester, Catherine McDonough from the um, Turing Institute in London, and assuming she gets here, uh, Joanna Taylor from Manchester as well. So without further ado, can I pass over to, to Luca, who is going to make a start on this? Over to you, Luca. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll actually start. And Luca, shall I share the slides the whole time? And then yeah, yeah. Um, you guys yeah. great. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. Up. Thanks so much, Ian, for that introduction. Thanks, Ian, for this. Um, I'm sure Joe will be with us momentarily. Um, and if, yeah, if you could just go to the second slide, please. Um, I, I did want to just add some caveats to uh, the, the quick introduction um, that was done. I have to say, you know, when I wrote that abstract for this session, it's, it's obviously a very US centric abstract. And, um, and so I think it's really important to highlight today, especially for this conversation, that, you know, while some of our examples are going to be very North American or Euro Eurocentric, um, we're really, really excited to um, hear about other histories and ideas uh, that that are in the room and and to talk about those in the discussion and and especially in um, what's going to follow before my first kind of um, case study example is a is really um, I wouldn't even call it a chronology. It's really just two moments in time. Uh, in sort of the history of spatial history that um, I'm just going to talk through quickly to give us some grounding and some some kind of food for thought uh, for the discussions. So next slide. Great. So uh, I think the other thing, you know, as Ian, as Ian said, uh, we do have these kind of motivating questions uh, and uh, these have also evolved since uh, we first wrote that abstract uh, back for spatial humanities. Uh, in in 2019, I think, uh, and so I just wanted to also um, sort of put those up as as points for discussion. And and the first is, you know, really, who is spatial history for? Uh, is it only for historians? Uh, and this is a really nice segue to the second question, uh, which is, you know, how does spatial history fit into these other categories? As Ian mentioned, we often, you know, talk much more broadly about the spatial humanities today. Um, and this is because uh, there's lots of fields that are interested in the juxtaposition of sort of digital methods of spatial analysis and inquiry uh, into spatial questions in the humanities and the social sciences. And this is everything from uh, historical GIS to, um, uh, to, to literary cartography, the broader field of digital humanities, um, and, and indeed, um, you know, words that I hear often at the Turing being around data scientists, uh, spatial data science and urban analytics. 
Third, we're interested in not assuming that spatial history is always digital or computational, but of course there is a really strong connection between spatial investigation in the humanities um, and the historical social sciences and uh, digital and computational methods. And you're going to be seeing three perspectives from Luca and Joe and I that definitely um, are, depend on digital history digital methods. The fourth question is uh, kind of what we're going to be focusing on in our individual um, uh, brief talks, which is what are the challenges and opportunities in spatial history today? And then hopefully one of the things that we'll focus on in the conversation is what are the stakes of doing digital spatial history going to be a decade from now? Um, so just to get us started, um, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, and really the, the slide after that as well. So just to get us started, I'm going to look at so two very brief uh, moments in, in the history of, of, of spatial history. Uh, and, and the first of these is a really important article that Anne Kelly Knowles uh, published as an introduction to a special issue on historical GIS in social history science in, in 2000. Um, and in this piece, she's reflecting on two previous year's sessions at the annual Social Science History Association um, meeting that I'm sure uh, people in the room uh, were at, uh, that were dedicated to using uh, geographic information systems for historical research. Uh, and um, right away, uh, she makes a statement that's really still something that we come back uh, frequently to even today. Uh, and that's really the promise of historical GIS as a method for social science history. Uh, that is, um, quote, that it makes space an explicit part of analysis. It extends quantification and systemic empirical analysis to questions, scales, and evidence that few historians have considered. Um, and uh, in, in the quote here, uh, however, she points out um, some of the, in a sense, uh, the, some of the perils <laughs> of, of trying to do this work. Uh, on the one hand, that uh, she says that GIS experts usually lack historians training in the appreciation and careful contextualization of source material. And on the other hand, historians rarely possess the technical facility that GIS training inculcates and are often uneasy with the visual way of knowing um, that's inherent to exploring and representing spatial data. Uh, and as far as I know, she says uh, in 2000, the potential for using GIS in historical research is only now beginning to dawn on American geographers. Uh, later in that same article, she, she, um, she makes a kind of pitch for what the three main reasons that GIS as a method for history is, is really powerful. And she says, first, that space is an important unit of analysis, but depends on having accurate spatial boundaries. I think this is an issue that is going to come up a couple times uh, in, in the, in the uh, comments that are going to follow. Second, she says that we have an unsophisticated knowledge about, quote, the spatial aspects of human history, such as uh, the examples she gives are the changing importance of physical geography as a constraining and enabling factor to the geographical expression of social structures. And finally, she says that only by making maps of data can we reveal uh, the real dimensions of historical reality and change that no other mode of analysis can, can show us. Um, so this list, I think, is a nice uh, foundation point for the conversation today. And uh, we can see both how some of these uh, aspects remain really central to the pursuit of digital spatial history um, and how also some of them have, um, you know, we've we've kind of rethought our relationship to these to these uh, to these points. So next slide, please. Um, so my last sort of uh, bit that I want to take from from this introduction, which is really such a rich piece of, of writing, is um, uh, where where Knowles highlights <laughs> the one of the things that so many people uh, here today will be familiar with, and that is what she says um, as the most unusual and sometimes most time consuming aspect of historical GIS is the process of converting historical analog data to digital form. The rule of thumb among GIS users is that up to 95% of project time goes to preparing the system to yield results. 
And that estimate comes from practitioners who download much of their data from pre-existing digital files, converting analog historical sources and locating historical places and objects can add significant time to a project's preparatory stage. Um, truer words were never spoken. Um, all right, so next slide, please. Great. So I just want to kind of hop over uh, a huge <laughs> um, mass of research between 2000 uh, and 2007, just to point out one of the things that was kind of already beginning to change, uh, sorry, in uh, 2017, in uh, the really important white paper that came out of um, this kind of Center for History and uh, New Media and the Mellon Foundation on digital history and argument. And they have a section on spatial history uh, in, that, in that paper where they, where they say that spatial analysis, as distinct from mapping, considers the role of space and place in historical processes, whether that analysis occurs conceptually through theory or empirically through statistical computation. Digital historians make arguments through spatial analysis whenever they compute on location data in order to understand how geography or region shaped a historical process. And so this, I think, is highlighting the ways that you know uh, we're acknowledging that digital spatial history is moving away from um, mapping as the inevitable goal of, of digital history. Uh, and with that, I'm just going to move into my own kind of uh, sort of experience uh, uh, to date. Uh, next slide, please. With um, with something that is you know a bit a bit different from these earlier pursuits in digital history. So yeah, fine. Next slide. Great, and that is with the example of the research we've been doing on living with machines. Um, I think my colleague Daniel Wilson is here today and there's many other people involved in this research. Um, those of you who were at Spatial Humanities might have seen this paper. And, and that's really considering not maps as the final output or the kind of exploratory site in, in spatial history, but really as the input uh, to a spatial history project. And here what you see is um, an ordnance survey map from the 19th century. These have been digitized by the National Library of Scotland. Uh, and what we've been doing really is using computer vision to analyze uh, the visual features of this, these maps in, according to uh, labels that, that we choose um, uh, as part of answering a historical question. Uh, and this is possible because there are there are really hundreds of thousands of maps available now online. Uh, and map data is, uh, as such, is kind of a reality. Uh, the continuing high cost of historical geospatial data creation, um, as Knowles pointed out uh, 20 years ago, paired with this massive explosion in online map collections has created a body of scholarship in GI science um, and sort of the computational geography uh, world that's focused on historical map processing um, or this kind of automatic extraction and geolocation of map content. Um, this is this real this research really positions map processing as they call it as an end-to-end -end workflow that produces carefully curated um, created analysis ready historical geospatial data uh, that really mimics the manual vectorization process in GIS. So if automatic map processing was an afterthought even a decade ago, it's now a well-funded challenge for many teams around the world. Uh, scientists and businesses see immense value in historical maps like they do um, remote sensing data to create fine-grained longitudinal data sets about housing stock, forest cover, uh, or mining resources. So as, as I said, um, you know, on Living with Machines, our goal was not to, to speed up the process of making new vector data. Rather, we wanted to create a method for iteratively asking questions and creating very simple uh, sort of point-based CSV outputs that can be, then be analyzed as geolocated structured data, either both in a map um, and outside of a map context. Uh, so the input to the pipeline are these scanned maps and the outputs are the predictions of these researcher defined labels that correspond to a certain area of the map. And, you know, we, we call these patches and what you see here are um, the, the, the centroid points of patches represented on the map of, of railway infrastructure around Cardiff. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Great. So I'm just going to wrap up here by saying that using maps as data really encourages a particular approach to spatial history. 
uh, that allows us to kind of sidestep this problem of spatial boundaries uh, and arguments based on aggregated polygons, though of course it, it has the potential to be combined and layered up with these. It allows us to integrate new kinds of primary sources into computational workflows that before were really just too big, too difficult to tackle um, in terms of creating manual manual data sets. Uh, and importantly, it sort of integrates data creation with analysis in a computational workflow so that we're we're not um, we're not kind of unknowingly spending too much time um, um, simply on data creation without that being a, a sort of going hand in hand with asking questions of the data. And finally, and, I, and this is a point that will also um, differ from uh, what a lot of people do, is that this is a really inherently interdisciplinary um, and team-based uh, endeavor. Uh, this is not something that, you know, for example, I as a historian uh, would be doing completely on my own. Uh, we're working with data scientists who have experience with geospatial data. Uh, and um, it's really essential to be, to be kind of have that multiple kinds of expertise. So finally, I think um, just to kind of reiterate, uh, while we're using maps uh, of our output in here, what you see are outputs of both the presence of buildings and the presence of railway infrastructure at the patch level uh, uh, for London. You'll recognize Greater London here. Um, but we're also using other computational methods of analysis to analyze the patterns and distributions in our data. And the coloring here in these particular visualizations that you see uh, is based on um, the proximity of buildings to rail infrastructure, right? So it's really thinking about how we can use statistical measures to understand the relationship between different features in the landscape that we're picking up using computer vision uh, that allows us to think about, think about those patterns. And we can do that both both in the map, but not only through the visual exploration of the map, um, but also through simply working with the quantitative uh, structured uh, geolocated data. Uh, and, and, and through that, I think to, to kind of pick a uh, return to, to Knowles's points is through that both of those methods, we can really access uh, the spatial dimensions of, of history. Uh, and that's it for me. I'm going to turn it over to Luca. All right. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Katie. Can, can everyone hear me? Yeah, OK, perfect. OK, so I would like to emphasize a, um, a different dimension um, of spatial history. I would like to briefly talk about the intellectual and the epistemological work that happens in the process of visualization and in a sense um, 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 look at maps as argument. And that comes from from conversations, mostly informal conversations that um, I have had with, um, with 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 colleagues in the field, and at least Catherine, Katie, in the last in the last in the last years. And it seems to me, or it came out from these conversations, it seems to me that a lot of the innovation that we have seen in spatial history in the last ten to twenty years was driven by the desire and new ways to collect and process data. Um, so. A lot of early spatial history projects worked primarily with structured data. So you could find um, um, a lot of works, Richard White's work with freight tables, for example, all kinds of databases. And we have seen in recent years an increasing turn towards work with unstructured data, um, textual data, so, so the use of, of natural language processing um, techniques for geographic text analyses. And then um, um, most recently, the kind of computer vision work that Katie um, that Katie has shown us, um, so the work with, uh, where, where digitized imagery is used as data, so work that we're seeing at the Turing at Stanford and, and, and probably at a lot of other places. Um, so, and what I find interesting there is that a lot of considerable technical and conceptual sophistication is invested into the input side, if you like, of spatial history. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's a lot about um, finding innovative and more creative ways of collecting and processing data. And at the same time, my sense is that less energy has gone into the maps and the graphics that we produce. So um, to put it bluntly, a lot of the maps that we see nowadays uh, look the same as 10 or 20 years ago. And I, th I think that's perfectly fine when, when the maps are a tool for exploring patterns in the data, um, when we have um, um, schematic data or um, maps or data that is maps that are created with out of the box software or tools. Um, and, and, and so and I think overall, when I talk to colleagues, I'll see a lot more people are interested in working in Python or in R than I see people who are interested in working in, 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 in JavaScript. 
Now, this, 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 this the, the reason why I'm emphasizing the visual argument here is not so much um, is not so much a matter of aesthetics, though that certainly also plays into it. But it is, um, I, th I think, what we are in a sense not losing to a certain point is is is, is using maps as a form of visual argument. And there's of course a, a long tradition of that kind of scholarship, right? There's it's, it's arguments that have been made in critical cartography. So um, I, I like this quote from Margaret's Wick, Wicken, Margaret Wickens Pierce, um, and which in a sense exemplifies a long critical engagement with the positivist and ethnocentric assumptions that are baked into GIS and geospatial technology, which has led to different reactions, whether that's um, um, whether it's an outright rejection of cartography or, or GIS, and in a sense, the a, a concern with a almost post-cartographic ways of, of visualization. Whereas for others, it has meant a more creative engagement and an appropriation of these techniques. So in the case of um, Margaret Wickens Pierce, um, 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 what, what's interesting in this quote um, where she says, um, so she's talking about ways of um, finding indigenous ways of mapping or ways of mapping that are more um, that have a strong affinity to indigenous sensibilities. And um, what, what she's arguing for is, is that rather um, than um, 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 creating um, new um, new kinds of data or new data sets, um, um, existing data can be used um, to better depict indigenous place merely uh, through a careful consideration of form. That is the way that cartographic language is used to represent that digital um, data. And what's interesting here is that we have an intervention that does not call um, Right, for creating new or more complete data, um, but, <clears throat> but someone who emphasizes the opportunity to develop and experiment with the cartographic language that is used to represent that data. Um, now, one common criticism, and that's also a criticism that they made in that article of, 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 of maps, and as, as we all know, plenty, but one, one concerns the um, homogenized, disembodied view from nowhere. Um, and um, some scholars um, are, um, have argued then that oblique angles and the situated perspective of three-dimensional maps um, can um, uh, help to escape that view from 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 nowhere. And there have been interesting interventions into in, in, into cartographic ways of addressing and bringing in spatial subject positions. Um, another um, recent intervention is an article by um, by Bill Rankin. Um, that um, is a is a reminder in a sense that the visual itself can be a site of scholarship and Rankin and I might I think I might just share the the link for that here in the chat and you can um, you can just uh, click on that article if you wanna if you wanna see it um, um, so actually sorry that link might be incomplete well anyway I'll have it on the slides um, um, now, Rankin is particularly concerned with the problem of visual hierarchy and in particular the distinction between background and foreground, which can seem like a subtle graphic detail, but um, it shows quite compellingly, I think, that it is more uh, meaningful than that. Now, on maps um, created by historians, in this case maps published in the work of Lucien Fevre, the background has often been is often presented as the space in which history takes place, a space that is often stable and ahistorical, where the foreground then displays the historical activity or the structure. Um, in question. Um, and the implicit assumptions, um, there are implicit assumptions here about what historical phenom phenomena are dynamic and which are stable, what is human and what is not human, um, or what is normal and what is exceptional. And as an alternative, um, Rankin proposes this map of Phoenix that aims to avoid um, simple visual hierarchy. And um, if you if you look at this map, and I'll, I'll share the link where you'll find it in a, in a minute, um, um, it's almost impossible in this map to tell where the background ends and the foreground begins, and that's very much intentional. So rather than reinforcing the usual dichotomy between city and desert, between human, non-human, dynamic and empty, or urban and rural, the goal is to show, in this case, the Phoenix metropolitan area as a as a, as a triple intersection of um, topographic disposition, human activity, and human uh, categories, and each in historical interactions with the other. Now, this kind of intervention also ties in with the work of scholars like Johanna Drucker, who recently criticized um, that um, mapping and data visualization in the digital humanities, but also more broadly, is often seen as a one-way process where display is simply a surrogate for the data. And she ties that back to a longstanding distrust of visual methods as a primary mode of epistemological work. And um, um, instead, um, what scholars like um, 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 Rankin or Drucker um, suggest um, is to, instead of uh, just using maps and, and visualizations to discover um, patterns in the data, the goal could be to 
find visual strategies for seeing the world differently. And I think that has an immediate relevance also to those of us um, who emphasize the digital uh, dimension of this work, because um, um, creative experimental technologies for, geogra for graphic display that give the authors considerable artistic control have become increasingly accessible. So one doesn't necessarily need to be able to code um, to create um, um, 3D maps, to insert into activity, to work with animation. And I think there are interesting ways of integrating situated perspectives, of manipulating visual hierarchy, of bringing time into it, and um, also cyclical time, right? Uh, times of day, ebb and flow, seasonality, to bring in the physical environment, and also um, um, work, recent work in qualitative spatial representation. So um, that's what I wanted to to share essentially, and I think the question that I that I would like to put for for the discussion is is to is what is the place of of the visual in in spatial history today, and where uh, where do we see it um, see it going? And I'll pass on to uh, to Joe at this point. We can't hear Joe. Better? Great. Yeah, Can you keep control of the slides, slides Lika? Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, <laughs> sorry, I was late. It's a, a comedy of errors in that, um, as Luca knows, our Wi-Fi at Manchester is not really working, <laughs> so just not ideal for a, a DH hangout. So I want to pick up on quite a lot of what Luca's been um, been saying in particular to turn to the idea of maps as text. So that is maps as um, something to be maps as interpretations, I guess. Um, so, and I'm coming at this more from um, the angle of being a literary scholar, a literary historian, uh, I suppose. So my impulse is quite often to read poetics into things. So I want to demonstrate a little bit how to do that with maps. So a limitation of, of GIS and digital mapping in spatial literary history has been that they've risked divorcing the text from the reader um, and and so from meaning. It seemed to kind of impose a barrier for a lot of scholars. Mapping just the places mentioned in a text often tells you very little, um, either about the place or about the, the written work itself. But what if we treat maps the way we treat our sources, so as objects to be analysed and interpreted, and from a literary perspective, um, as objects to be analysed and interpreted in ways that might feel um, against the grain, um, or or the emphasised elements of, of play in our interpretation and our readings. Can I have the next slide, Luca? So this is a quotation that a few people at the Spatial Humanities Con Conference um, picked up. It's from an article that I, I really like from a few years ago from Marco Juven. And Juven argues um, that um, essentially interpretation needs to happen between different elements of the map and between the map and the text. So he writes that GIS maps, graphs and statistical tables that bring together primary data are themselves nothing but meta texts. So that is texts that are about texts. As such, they need interpretation, which in turn inevitably affects the ideological mental structure of the subject. And by subject, he means the, the researcher. So he's emphasizing here the really kind of subjective nature of um, of the research that we do as literary scholars, literary historians, um, and emphasizes the place of the researcher, of the reader, as a kind of intermediary between these different kinds of texts. So what this approach emphasizes, I think, is the creativity that every reader has to bring to both the map and the text, and the map as text, um, to to kind of hold open the door as well for alternative, both alternative ways of reading a map, but also alternative forms of mapping. So these alternative ways of, of interpreting spaces might encourage us, I think, to move away from the kinds of heterogeneity, um, certainties, positivities that technologies like GIS have risked overlaying onto our histories and um, and our sources. And different projects across diff of cross literary studies have experimented with visualizations in different ways. Um, Luca, can you go to the next one? So Barbara Piatti's work on the literary atlas of Europe is pretty well known. This um, particular example uses fuzzy boundaries um, 
as a way of emphasizing the contingency of mapping anything literary. So the fuzzy boundaries are supposed to indicate the fact that mapping any fictional text is never going to be certain. Um, there's always going to be a degree of fuzziness about it, if only because as in the kind of Virginia Woolf line of thinking, even if you're talking about, say, London in a fiction, the fictional London is never actually London. So there's always a kind of fuzziness between what we what we mean when we say London in a text and what we mean when we, we sort of map London. On the right hand side of the screen, this comes from the Geospatial Innovation and the Digital Humanities project. Um, Ian Gregory was the PI. This is the project that I was a postdoc on. And this this form of visualization kind of does the opposite in some ways. It indicates a degree of certainty. So the map on the top links the word beautiful to place names. So this is where beautiful co-occurs within 10 words of a place name. And the bottom does the same with sublime. It indicates a degree of certainty because it, it indicates that we can link certain terms to specific places. The three dogs that are here are very moved by this. Um, so these projects all take a, a, a distant view of places, that kind of view from nowhere that Luca was talking about, in that they're, they're distant readings, firstly, obviously, but they also assume that bird's eye top down view of, um, of place. The politics of that perspective um, are, are often evident in our conclusions. Um, and they so in ways that they, they highlight, our readings often highlight the places where patterns are most intense, um, for instance. But readings like that might obscure um, more important questions. So for example, what's being neglected? What are the white spaces on the map telling us as much as the dark spaces? So what's being overlooked or neglected in the historical record when we apply this kind of um, top down approach to to reading these map texts? These kinds of questions are things that have been concerning feminist GIS scholars for over 20 years. Um, and geographers, including Doreen Massey, have been asking these questions since um, since the 90s and have been emphasizing the need to treat everybody, everybody reading, everybody writing, everybody mapping as different. Um, and so everybody is needful of different and specific kinds of mapping. Donna Haraway goes, um, has gone even further recently. She thinks that a feminist mapping practice would register what she calls a view from a body rather than a view from above. Can you go to the next slide, Luca? There's been some work. Oh, can you click again? Sorry. Um, there's been some work recently on um, on how wearables might um, might work in um, in uh, subjects from the humanities. So Isabel Pedersen has done some really amazing work in this area. The images on the slide here are two maps of the same place um, from some work that um, I did that I've written up with Chris Donaldson. It'll be out next year. Um, and it shows a walk around the Scarfell Pike Massif in uh, the Lake District. So the one on the right is your um, sort of standard GIS map of it. The one on the left is heart rate and elevation data taken from my um, watch when we did a recreation of this walk um, a couple of years ago. So wearables might offer um, a kind of um, a, a promise, a way of, of involving the body and a series of individual bodies in our um, our readings and in our mappings. So maps like this might uh, offer ways of reintroducing the body and with it highlight the significance of individual embodied processes within collective space making practices. And that, I think, has the real potential to highlight the plurality of space making and space experiences in ways that GIS can sometimes risk obscuring. So I just want to quickly run through a couple of other ways of performing this kind of interrogation between the map and the text done by other people working roughly in this kind of literary space. Um, Luca, can you go to the next one? So this is from uh, the poet and digital writer J.R. Carpenter's um, collection, The Ocean of Static. So Carpenter is really interested both in the poetics of mapping and the mapping of poetry. The Ocean of Static was her 2018 collection. 
And that collection combines uh, wind, weather and ship log data alongside coding languages in order to create maps, written maps, I guess, that challenge the idea that, that space and especially sea space is in any way static in her work, space is always mobile. So in this and her 2017 collection, The Gathering Cloud, Carpenter combines um, metaphorical, geographical and digital modes of mapping histories to create something that's um, even while it's pinned on a page, feels very, um, very movable. It complements, I think, really nicely a lot of what a lot of the mobilities, the wearable technologies, wearable forms of mapping can also involve in in our work. And uh, the next one, please, Luca. This example is from Sally Bushell's work on quantitative cartographies at Lancaster, and it's a it's a version of what she refers to in her book, Spatializing the Literary Text, as cognitive mapping. Um, and this kind of mapping is interested in mapping the imaginative experiences of the reader as much of the, as the text. So it, again, it's, it resituates the reader as an intervention point between um, text and map, map and text. So that this kind of visualization becomes a co-production between reader, text and technology. And that technology might either be digital or, um, or analog. I think one other other thing that it's worth mentioning in this space is uh, work on qualitative spatial representation, a, um, a method that highlights relational or situational mapping, where where the where something precisely is matters kind of less than where or how it's experienced or alongside what is it, it's experienced with. So that approach, like feminist GIS. Um, or embodied mapping or cognitive mapping also highlights that plurality of place and the mobility of place. It emphasizes the kind of multivalent dimensions that any given location might possess. Central, I think, to all of these approaches, and I think the question that I want to introduce is the um, a willingness to let go of the idea of a map or a GIS as only a rigid structure and to re-embrace mapping as a form of movement, but also specifically as a form of moving play. Um, my last slide, please, Luca. This is my absolute favourite quotation of any work on, um, uh, on GIS. Um, it's one that I use all the time, so I'm pretty sure that almost everyone here will have heard me quote it before. This is um, another one from Anne Kelly Knowles, along with Levi Westerveld and Laura Strom. And they argue that um, that we need to be careful about the way that we talk about GIS um, and mapping technologies when we're having these kinds of conversations. They say that whereas tool is singular, technology can be plural. As a technology, GIS is not a single tool, but a bundle of techniques with many capabilities. Not a hammer, but a workbench or more than a workbench, a workshop. So then what happens to spatial histories of all kinds, literary or not? when we allow the messiness and happenstance of a workshop to come to the fore, when we let things break, actually when we deliberately push them to breaking point, what new intellectual possibilities, what new questions, what new sources, what new perspectives might be pulled through the cracks we'd be creating when we deliberately try to push things to their edge. I'll stop there. Good, thank you very much to uh... To all three of you, um, an awful lot in that. Um, so, shall we open this to the floor and uh, ask whether anybody out there has got any questions uh, to build on or to come back on anything that was said by our three speakers? Anybody? Well, and someone has to. Well, my only question isn't a question. It's uh, where's the applause feature on Microsoft Teams? <laughs> uh, it's up about there. Yeah. I couldn't even figure out how to share my screen, so I don't know the answer. To that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. So um, questions from the floor. I'll go again. Are the slides going to be available somewhere? I'm I'm first timer here, so I don't know how the publication works. 
Yeah, yeah, I think we can definitely um, I can make uh, share those and make that we can figure out how to make those available. Yeah. Carl, do you want to come in on uh, that uh, Knowles thing that uh, Knowles Levy Vestervelt thing that you just uh, put something in the chat about? Hmm. Um, yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Everyone that I know and everyone I don't know. Um, the discussion of uh, alternative forms of mapping and uh, evocation of place, uh, particularly in the last talk, uh, put me in, and then the quote from Ann Knowles and Levy Westerfield, uh, led me to think of a project that they did. Levy was a, a, a principal graphical artist and cartographer for it. Um, it's just extraordinary. I put a link in the chat um, that ties narrative very closely to an animation of uh, gestures drawn on some uh, what we use, what we call an architecture bumwa, just just like tracing paper, um, uh, and the product of which is just I thought it was wonderful. I haven't seen things like it, so I just wanted to share that link. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, Carl. Levy, um, Levy by the way, was an undergrad Sorry. at the time, an undergraduate student at the time that he did that work. Yeah. James Butler. Can't hear you. Sorry, is that better? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Gaming mic, sorry, too many too many switches and buttons. Um, no, that was a fascinating talk. Thank you all contributors. And then, um, and Joe, I really liked, I really appreciated you bringing in chronotopic cartographies. Um, <laughs> well, you would. <laughs> Absolutely. But my question is- James is the postdoc on chronotopic cartographies and a lot of those visualizations are his, um, his and Duncan and Rebecca's brain child, brain children. <laughs> well, thank you very much for acknowledging. Uh, but um, my question just relate to that and some of the work I'm doing at the moment on um, literary namescapes. And I'm interested in your thoughts um, a little bit, a little bit deeper, a little bit to delve a little bit deeper into how big of a divide do you think exists between the approaches that consider um, abstract maps as pure data versus the more traditional perception of um, of are uh, 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 the more concrete iterations of maps, and do you think that that is a challenge? Uh, how big of a challenge do you think it is to try and unite those two, um, those two preferences, if that makes sense? Because um, yes, Katie, have you got anything on on that from the kind of you're on yeah. mute. Sorry, I'm mulling. Let me continue thinking for a second. Yeah. So do you want me to witter while you mull? Um, so I think some of the, the um, I mean, I think obviously chronographic cartographies has done some really interesting things, uh, beginning to offer different kinds of bridges between um, more kind of abstract maps and more geographically concrete ones. Stuff like QSR, I think, is um, is potentially a really exciting mode for that in the sense that it's that those more abstract maps are often more about relationality than necessarily about um, being able to pin somewhere down. So I'm thinking of somewhere like Hardy's maps of Wessex. You can pin them down, but the point is is as much about the relationship between the places and the characters with the places as it is on concretely being able to map them. So having a couple of different forms of mapping that can overlay onto each other and and also I think I think this is one area where it's really important to maintain that awareness that those abstract maps are in the first place signs of play um, and by that I mean kind of creativity and and, and mobility and um, and an ability to kind of uh, register different forms of geographies all at the same time um, so uh, practices that that combine these kinds of different approaches and that aren't overly prescriptive about pinning down exactly where X is or where Y is, I think might be. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, think that's... I think it tied in wonderfully to your point about space being experienced from, from an embodied position. Um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Katie. Sorry. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, no, that's a great point. And I, I just, I think I agree with that. And I think 
you know, it's just the the kind of provocative statement about like why do we need to make maps <laughs> is really driven by I think like a long experience of the difficulty of locating historical places and in in sort of you know working with abstract representations of spatial information and indeed focusing on the relationships between um you know uh, uh the 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 occurrence of spatial information in text in structured data in images it really allows us to sort of even if only temporarily skip over that huge hurdle of having to geolocate something in order to therefore understand its spatial relevance so i i just i think that you know the 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 kind of progress and really exciting research in network analysis uh, is is has really um, encouraged us to think that way. And there's other kinds of visualization, other kinds of ab abstraction that are really helpful. But for me, network analysis kind of played a role in helping me to step just step aside uh, from from the the kind of drive to geolocate. Um, Great. Thank you. Did you want did you want to come in with something, Patty? Yes, no. Um, I, I'm really there's a question um, from uh, Tamson, if I may, in the in the chat about uh, introducing spatial history to undergrads. And um, yeah, I think I think there is so much, uh, but there's really, it's really an opportunity. I mean, it depends on where you're teaching it, right? And I think that was what really motivated me to want to have this conversation with all of you <laughs> is, is this sort of question of where it sits. You know, it, sit, it can sit in so many places uh, institutionally, uh, in, in, you know, different disciplines um, and in, in history, it feels like it's, it, it can be quite, you know, sidelined in history itself. Um, and um, so, yeah, I think it is interesting of like the question of where we, where and when we talk to students about this kind of work. And of course, how we, how we connect um, these sort of digital approaches to spatial history to just general like spatial thinking um, about, about history. Uh, I, I think often we kind of jump the gun and we want to talk about, um, so just to to take the to take the Knowles quote like the the digital workshop environment for working with spatial history, uh, without explaining like why that is um, why that's like intellectually useful. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I just I I I dropped a slide that had a quote from Ian. I'm sorry, Ian, but it was it's it's just it's a <laughs> you know it's it's the statement right that you shouldn't just be sort of thinking about your data I was like, oh, I have spatial data. What can I do with it? Um, but rather I have a I have a question that has a spatial uh, dimension and I can work with these sources to help me answer those questions. And um, and I and I think that that is really maybe the best starting point with students is to really think about um, to think about what are what is a way of asking a question that where space is an important part of the answer. Um, uh, that is something that I think a lot of historians don't get trained in. And, and so before we kind of, or alongside the exploration of method, which for spatial history, you know, is incredibly digital, I think, um, uh, we, we have to also do that. Maybe. Yeah, maybe I can say something to that question as well. So the, the, the way I saw, so I'm teaching a spatial history course for um, third years at the, at the University of Manchester, which is also, well, actually it's at the same time, it's also for MA students. And the, I think the way, the way I structured it is, is, I think it's on the one hand, it's, it's, it's based, so every week is based around the theme. So it could be, um, there is, for instance, I don't know, um, spatial history of segregation, where we read specific scholarship in that field or something about, um, in, in indigenous mapping, there is something about disease mapping, there is something about, um, so in a sense it's very thematic in that and I think that's important in my experience because students are easily overwhelmed when when you confront them um, with spatial history as just a question of method 
um, which makes a lot of sense to us, but to them is perhaps less um, less tangible. But I found that the students really enjoy it and really like it. Um, and, and some of them take it very far. They use QGIS and they really push themselves and others instead um, leave it at a, at a simple level technically. But I think the I think the thing that perhaps most that that I would like them to take away, and I think they do, is that um, data is as much of a historical source as um, as the as the as well as the conventional material printed or, or manuscript or, what, uh, or other sources that they work with. And I think that is something that students are increasingly um, aware of. So I think in some ways that is that is something where we can also, yeah, I think that that's something where spatial history also has a um, has can make an um, play an important role in the history curriculum nowadays. Can I add one very quick point? Um, I don't know if anyone saw the thing that James Baker shared on Twitter a few weeks ago about the gender disparity between digital humanities students. But one thing, so I teach a, similarly to Luca, a third year enhanced course, so it's third year in MA on literary landscapes. Um, and one of the ways of getting students through the door, like they like it when they're in there, but they're really nervous about it beforehand, um, particularly because of assessments. And one of the ways of kind of solving that has been to highlight the texts and then kind of be like, oh, and the maps are a thing that'll happen like over there. And then when they're in, then GIS train them. But James Baker was sharing some, um, I, I'll dig out the link in a minute, um, was sharing some research that suggests that there's a gender element to that. So that suggests that women students are more reticent about going into a classroom with where digital st skills are going to be a um, a priority. So I think there's there's some really serious conversations and thinking that needs to happen around the way that we're framing these courses. Um, so just to make sure that those those disparities don't carry on. OK, a um, couple of hands up, Christine. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi. I'm in from the University of Maine, where Anne is actually. But um, I, I had a question that about, um, I guess, approaching some of the more creative forms of cartographic presentation or even any visualization. I think that when you're working on it, everything is legible. But when you're sharing it to others, it is really hard to get people to understand what you're showing them. So I was curious about your thoughts about how to communicate or teach legibility about such broad topics you know in just one or in a couple of visualizations luca i feel like you have things to say about that. i know i'm looking yeah. at luca as well but you can't tell that <laughs> i'm just uh, <laughs> i'm just yeah no i mean it, it is a it is a it is an it is an important question and um i think the I think in a way these visualizations, because I, I think I, I, de I definitely agree a lot of this work is is not necessarily immediately or intuitively legible and the reader kind of needs to be pointed to it. And I think there is nothing wrong in doing that. So that could be as simple as, as, as I don't know, as just having as having captions for for, for figures that, that highlight the elements that that, that, that readers should pick up or things that they should look at to more methodological discussions about what exactly the intention behind the visualization is. So I think in, in this Rankin article that I quote, I think he does that very nicely by explaining um, what, why exactly certain graphical um, choices were, um, were made. Um, I don't think I have a much better answer than than that. But I think, I mean, it is it is a challenge. And frankly, there's also in some of the, I think the challenge is also that sometimes we may think that a certain, a certain change that we made or a certain um, graphic choice that we made um, works in a certain way, but others, and that's a long-standing problem, I guess, in cartography, right? Others might perceive that very differently. Yeah, I mean, I think, or I, I would just say quickly that uh, the kind of primacy of text in humanities scholarship is like such a hard thing to to kind of work against when you're trying to publish something and write the push to have fewer figures um, is is right something to push back against I think in this work and I was just thinking about the example of the um, the um, the digital projects that uh, Stanford University Press publishes as a really nice example of like turning the tables and allowing the visualization to be the principal sort of tool of communication with text that really sets uh, sets up, um, explains and pushes 
further, you know, the kind of thinking that the visualizations are doing, but that's, um, you know, such an outlier. Uh, so I'm excited to see, you know, more and more projects that are doing that. But, uh, but yeah, we face this challenge of, well, just write about it. <laughs> just put it in the text, right? And ideally we're doing both. I think also there's an element of kind of in some in some instances that difficulty of pinning down a narrative is a strength of those visualizations that it leaves it open to interpretation um, and to new forms of readings, new new storytelling coming from the same um, the same starting point. Um, so while kind of constructing a narrative around images is I think one around the visualizations is I think one challenge. I think another is to be okay with some flexibility being left there. But, but also like working with experts in visualization, um, right? I think that we can't assume, you know, that we, when we're even making maps about our own research that, uh, yeah, we're thinking about the different ways that something might be um, interpreted by different reading audiences, by students, but, you know, people with different expertise, different cultural backgrounds. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, I really like that, that the, the quote, um, that, um, sorry, I'm blinking that Joe shared about, uh, sorry, that, that, that Luca shared from, from Rankin, right. That's about like moving into new ways of seeing the world. Uh, and, and I think, you know, when we do that well with a visualization, there's lots of ways of seeing the world in one visualization, um, but we have to we have to kind of be really explicit about how we're setting something up, what the data is, and and things like that. So there's a lot of space for improvement there, and I think talking with people who understand visual communication better than historians are usually trained in it is a starting point. Great. Right. Um, time is against us. Uh, can we just take one last uh, question from Sally on which is. Uh as a hand up and then we'll bring this to a halt. Sally. Hi, th hi everybody. I was, this is, it just made, it was just occurred to me when Katie was just speaking about stepping aside from geolocating things. And I just wondered if I could have some feedback from the panel on this. Um, I'm working on uh, research to do with cultural heritage and national libraries. And I suddenly thought, as you were saying this, what is the role of uh, space in a nation and uh, how the collection? So I'm thinking, for example, something like the British Library um, and all the former colonies and that sort of thing. So I'm just wondering, has anybody thought about um, nations in terms of space and thinking of diversity of communities and that sort of thing? So it was just from Katie's comment about stepping aside from all of this. And I just wondered just what your thoughts were on that. It's a bit of an unformed thought at the moment, but I, I just wondered if you've got any thoughts to share with that. Um, well, I, I think that the, just as a very nice connection to that, that that idea of new ways of seeing the world, right? We we don't have to be confined to these sort of settler colonial geographies or nationalist geographies. We, as we begin to develop new ways of of um, how to say making historical spatial information machine readable, we can think about how to frame that according to other kinds of geographic constructs. And, um, you know, I'm not going to know what all those are, right? I'm, I mean, I'm trained as an 18th century French historian. I think I, I think about France, right? And, and, and I think that, you know, that's what's so exciting about seeing, um, you, you know, unfortunately, we haven't like had any presentations today from people who are working, um, you know, on other continents. Um, I think that it, even just the right temporal diversity is so important in, th you know, kind of getting outside of the box of really typical spatial representation. So, um, you know, both spatial and temporal diversity in spatial history is, I think, a really an important source of creativity for where we're going in thinking spatially. Yeah. I think there's another element there as well that kind of eco diversity. So treating different kinds of matter as being equitable, so human, non-human, insect, tree, whatever. Um, 
those that kind of top down form of mapping the, the sort of bird's eye view version does tend to occlude that whereas what happens if we start mapping from the soil up for instance changing our perspectives in the way that Luca was um, gesturing towards in his um, in his presentation is there other ways that we then can kind of democratize ecological matter as well Brilliant, thanks. So I think that last point is very interesting to because for me, a national library should meet the the um, needs of the nation, and if we go with the diversity and from the bottom up, that's a much better um, way. So thanks very much for your feedback. Great. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. We're over time. Apologies for that, but that was a really, really interesting discussion. So thank you very much to all three of our speakers. Do feel free to find the, the uh, applause button if you can. Uh, round of applause for them. That was great.